before we get into this week's episode, I want to make a plug for Art Market Minute. This is Artnet News's new micro podcast hosted by Margaret Kerrigan, who's the site's news editor, Europe. It offers a weekly snapshot of essential art market news expertly compiled by the Artnet Pro editorial team. So when you look at artists like Colette and Kelsey, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to make a system that's equitable, where they have control. Hi, I'm Andrew Goldstein, and this is The Art Angle, a podcast from Artnet News where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest story down to earth. These days, with museums facing incessant protests and art world figures coming under withering fire for problematic behavior, Four of the most frightening words that an HR person could hear are, hello, it's Zachary Small. A relentless art reporter, Zachary has broken stories for Artnet News, the New York Times, and other publications that range from mass layoffs and health concerns at the newly reopened Metropolitan Museum of Art, to a Nashville art school's efforts to purge all non-Christian faculty, to an investigation over racism complaints at the Guggenheim's Basquiat show that recently led to the ouster the museum's powerful chief curator. Zachary's journalism has shed light on the somewhat startling fact that the art world, once a welcoming place for kooky dreamers, has become to resemble, at least in some respects, a Dickensian morass of inequity, maltreated staff, and the impoverishing reality of working for low pay in high-rent cities. Lately, however, Zachary has found a gleaming spot of hope for arts drivers in an unlikely place— TikTok, the addictive Chinese app known for its viral memes and dance crazes. Today, to talk about how TikTok became an upbeat haven for artists and why the opportunities it offers are now unfortunately at risk, I'm pleased to have Zachary Small on the show. Thanks very much for coming on The Art Angle, Zachary. Thank you for having me. So we are going to talk about artists on TikTok But first, let's do a favor for all of our listeners who were born before 1980. Can you explain to me what is TikTok? TikTok is an app on the U.S. market store that was introduced by a Chinese company called ByteDance in 2017. So (laughs) it's a version of an app in China, which has a, a different interface. But basically what you do is a social media platform where you post videos up to 60 seconds, often involving you know, college age, teenagers dancing is what they're most known for at this point. And I did a little bit of research about TikTok and I I came across a delightful young woman named Charlie D'Amelio, who is 16 years old and she has a staggering 85.4 million followers. I think she's estimated to be worth somewhere between $3 million and $4 million thanks to her videos. And I also learned about another uh, charming young woman named Addison Ray who has 56.9 million followers and is worth around $2 million. Who are these people? And what on earth do they do on TikTok that makes them so successful? So Addison and Charlie are, you know, characteristic of the TikTok model. These are two competitive dancers who started doing these videos. There's nothing crazy about them. You know, there's no special effects. What they really represent is this sort of rags to riches model on TikTok. The algorithm (laughs) is such where it lets you search through and based on what you watch, you know, what you like, what you comment on, it gives you more of the same. But what's interesting about TikTok is, you know, users will tell you that it doesn't create an echo chamber. It really creates a better exploration feature than you'd have on something like Instagram or Twitter. It's, it's easier for outreach and discovery. Hmm. So what does all this have to do with art? That's a great question. Outreach and discovery. <laughs> <laughs> so... A lot of artists, you know, increasingly are coming to TikTok for this alternative model of finding audiences. It's really hard right now in the creative economy because of the pandemic. But even before the pandemic, there's the trope of the starving artist, right? We expect artists to suffer. Um, You know, it's expensive to get an MFA or even a BFA. And so what artists are doing on TikTok was sort of spurred by this $200 million creators fund that the app made to incentivize artists and other creators to come online and join the community. Now, just to break in here for a second, when you talk about artists, are you talking about, you know, your traditional fine artist working in a studio, or are you talking about a more expanded definition of artists? It's definitely expansive, but what's really interesting about TikTok is 
the people with the classical training are actually getting the most views, right? So these are people that are doing sculpture or figurative painting, for instance. People are really interested in those processes. And so you said there's a $200 million fund that was put towards cultivating these creators and bringing them onto the platform. How has that fund worked? They've been incentivized in a number of different ways. So the Creators Fund is one way which, you know, provided grants. This was kind of a lifeline during the pandemic for a lot of these artists that took the Creators Fund, right? Certainly any sort of financial incentive is always helpful when creating these platforms. Another way for some of the TikTok users, and this is relatively new, but their channels are monetized. So they get a couple cents per view. But, you know, when you're making 14 million views on one video for a couple minutes of work, that's not too bad. So you wrote about a couple of success stories of artists who have found a way to make TikTok work for them in a commercial sense. One of them was Colette Bernard. Can you tell me a little bit about her and what makes her such an interesting case study for how TikTok can work for artists? Yeah, so... Colette Bernard is a 21-year-old student at the Pratt Institute in New York, and she joined TikTok earlier this year. You know, she had been on Instagram, she's on Twitter, she's all over the place, and she's been trying to, you know, create an audience around her work. She had some success on Instagram, but that kind of petered out, and she says that she's really found a home on TikTok. So one of the first videos she posted was a video of a performance with her sculpture. It's called The Burden, and it's about contraceptive pills. So what she did with that video, she got millions of views, and then she worked off of that. Just to clarify, when you say it's a sculpture about birth control pills, it's actually a gigantic sculpture of birth control pills. (laughs) Right. It's kind of like a spiritual successor to Emma Solkowitz's uh, mattress performance at Columbia in 2015. And I believe that what she was doing in this TikTok was that she was carrying this around the city. She was taking it to the subway, looking a little bit blasé about carrying it through the city. Um, Right. And this kind of, it hits the sweet spot for the TikTok algorithm, I think, where you have this sort of nonchalant video. I mean, there's not a big to-do. She's carrying around the sculpture. It's clear what the sculpture is. uh, And it's really capturing little moments of, you know, side eye from New Yorkers trying to figure out what she's doing. So, Hmm. you know... It's authentic, it's a little bit funny, and it's interesting. And so what happened after she posted this TikTok video? Well, her channel blew up. And, you know, on her TikTok profile, she has a link to her own website, her own web store. And on that web store, you can buy her art. Are we talking about sculptures, paintings, or what what is she selling? So she has a range of things for sale. You know, it's interesting talking to different artists who use TikTok. A lot of them are looking at the, you know, what we would consider the lower end of the market. So they're making things for people, you know, in the TikTok age group of teens to 20s to buy. So these are things that are priced at like $50. And the amazing thing is it's been working for her. She's been shipping thousands of parcels. She's made roughly $10,000 over the last couple of months. Wow. That's been a huge change. She told me for the first time in her life, she has savings. You know, it's interesting because I was talking to our chief art critic, Ben Davis, earlier about the way artists are using TikTok. And he he actually pointed out that it reminded him of how street artists have been using these big public murals to drive audiences to their websites where they sell paraphernalia and prints and T-shirts and things like that. I think that's a great way to think about it. For these TikTok artists, you know, these are people that grew up with the internet. They're not scared of sort of the the branding aspect of the business. And that's what they've done. They've created a brand for themselves and they're ready to monetize it. You know, a lot of people are sick of the trope of the starving artist and they want to create a living around their work. Hmm. And what kind of art does she make in her fine art practice? And how does that relate to the kinds of videos that she posts on TikTok? Yeah, so in her art practice, she's making sort of similar sculptures. She's doing performance. She's still in school, so I I think the exact nature of her work is ever-changing. But certainly, you know, what you see on her online store, like these internet cursor pendants, the holographic stickers of an IUD, you know, it's all related to introspections and to feminism, I would say. You wrote in your article that there are a number of ways that TikTok is superior to other platforms like YouTube and Instagram when it comes to allowing independent creators to reach new audiences. 
What is it that makes TikTok a better tool for that? What makes TikTok a better tool for that, and specifically for artists, is this idea of discovery. You know, artists are the people that boost our creativity, right? Jog our imaginations. So when you come across something like that on TikTok, which, you know, has a scrolling feature, you just sort of press your finger up and the next video plays, that's going to catch your eye. So it plays into the instincts of an artist, but it also allows you to connect in an atmosphere that's overwhelmingly positive, right? So it's not like going on Twitter and sort of <laughs> getting a, a barrage of different comments, sometimes insults. The tenor on TikTok, at least for now, is pretty happy. I mean, that reminds me of, of another artist that you wrote about in your piece named Kelsey Landon. Who is she and how has TikTok changed her life? Yeah, so Kelsey was great to speak with. She's 30 years old, she lives in Pennsylvania, and she's a classically trained sculptor. So her chosen medium is bronze. A bronze sculpture is pretty expensive to make and it's pretty hard to make, right? So what she started posting on TikTok were the clay studies that she was making. Uh, and you know they would be really simple clay studies, like not a huge sculpture, but looking at someone's eyes or looking at how to make a nose, for instance. And these just, they took off. She's probably the most popular artist on TikTok right now. Wow. That's amazing. I mean, I actually tuned into her TikTok feed and I noticed that she has this kind of recurring thing that she does where she will film herself making a clay sculpture of, you know, eyes, uh, the bridge of a nose, the beginning of a forehead and ask her audience to guess which celebrity it is. And, and she calls it the Mystery Eyes series, <laughs> which seems to say something about the high, low appeal of what breaks through on TikTok. Is that, is that kind of par for the course? Yeah, and I, I think she would accept that as well. You know, when I spoke to Kelsey, what she said is, a lot of this is for entertainment. Like, I don't have a problem making art and entertaining the people that are following me. They're supporting my lifestyle. Kelsey is living as, you know, a full-time artist. She's making thousands of dollars a month off of her TikTok, and that's allowing her to create work. Before that, you know, she was doing pizza delivery jobs. She was doing construction work, anything to pay the bills. She has no problem giving back to her fans and doing these sorts of series, which actually started with a Harry Styles sculpture that she did in plaster, which really took huh. off. So we've been talking about some pretty young people here mm -hmm. uh, who have been figuring out how to bring art onto TikTok. Is it pretty much a young person's game? Not everyone is young and, and you know, it is pretty varied. So for instance, there's a 73 year old artist, a uh, Japanese man named Haramichi Shibasaki. He's kind of popularly known as the Bob Ross of Japan and he's taken social media by storm, uh, especially during quarantine with these how-to videos, which I think is actually a really good point, right? It's <laughs> kind of like you've taken minute snippets of those YouTube how-to videos, which I'm, I'm sure everyone watches, or maybe it's just me and created a, a popular model for TikTok. Uh, another person that I spoke to that didn't make it into the story is another artist named Justin Gaffrey, and he has a fine art manufacturing company. But on his TikTok, he shows you how to make these, you know, paint sculptures, which are really interesting. And I encourage everyone to look them up. Uh, he told me that his business, just in the paint manufacturing business, has quadrupled since he started his TikTok a few months ago. Wow. What is the art establishment doing on the platform? What, what are the museums, the galleries, you know, the traditional purveyors of culture doing on, on the platform? Mm, that's such a great question. The answer is not that much. You know, I think the joke within the art world is that museums and art institutions are always a, a couple of years behind the trends. And that's because, you know, honestly, it takes a lot of resources to do this on an institutional level. Mm -hmm. And a lot of museums that I spoke to on background for this article, we're saying, hey, we don't really have the resources right now because of the pandemic. And also, we don't know if this app is going to stay around for much longer because of the proposed ban by right. the Trump administration. So tell me about that ban. What is it that has turned TikTok into something that actually seems to be a, a geopolitical flashpoint in the US-China competition? It's a little complicated, but the essential news of the story is that in early August, President Trump issued executive orders that would effectively ban TikTok and WeChat in the United States. So these are two Chinese business owned apps. They're not owned by the Chinese state, just to clarify, but these are two apps 
that government officials in the U.S. and digital experts as well have some security concerns. They're worried that they are, you know, sort of farming data off of the users in ways that at least the U.S. government says may be a national security threat. The the core of TikTok is not a referral uh, software like on Facebook or Instagram where you get shown things based on your network and things that you've liked before. It's actually some kind of highly sophisticated and fairly occluded AI that chooses things for you. You could see how something like TikTok could be potentially used. But is this just a kind of a fantasy or is there a legitimate threat there? So when I talk to security experts in digital technology, what they tell me is, yes, every social media app to a certain extent is farming data, you know, off your phone or your computer or what you put into it. The issue with TikTok specifically is that there's a great lack of transparency, as you said, about what the algorithm is doing, how it makes those choices and what else it's taking from your phone. So, you know, this is obviously a risk. Uh, It's one that clearly millions of users who use TikTok daily aren't too worried about, but it kind of remains to be seen what's going to happen with the app. How likely do you think it is that, that this thing is going to actually be able to survive and stay operational in the United States? Frankly, I don't think anyone can tell right now. So the deal as it is would give Oracle and Walmart a 20% stake in TikTok, and they would create a new corporation called TikTok Global. The issue with that, of course, is it would only be a 20% stake and they wouldn't be getting the algorithm. The algorithm is what, you know, the U.S. government is worried about. But of course, this also brings up all of these greater, maybe scarier questions about what does it mean if we ban a certain app from a certain country for a certain reason, you know, what precedent does that set for other sorts of apps that we might want? So to take it down from this global perspective Mm -hmm. to Colette Bernard and Kelsey Landon, what would happen to them if this ban took place? What would happen to all the, the content, the videos, the audiences that they've built on TikTok? For people like Kelsey and Colette, this is the overwhelming fear. TikTok has become a source of vital income for them during the pandemic, and it's providing them money that they wouldn't have access to otherwise. They don't know what's gonna happen if TikTok is banned. They've both tried other social media channels. Kelsey said, you know, maybe I will go to YouTube, but the problem with YouTube is, you know, those videos take a lot of time and energy to make, right? So the payoff might not be worth it. It's hard to discover YouTube channels relative to something like TikTok. What Kelsey said to me was, you know, eventually I might have to get a job with Uber or Lyft. So I think when you're looking at the story of TikTok and thinking about the art world, it's really a story about how the creative economy continues to morph really rapidly, especially in recent years. And yet there's always a story there of boom and bust, right? The artists find a model and then that model might not be there for much longer. It's very interesting because this actually connects unexpectedly in a way to an earlier article that you wrote for us about the devastating phenomenon of brain drain that the arts industry is facing right now. What is happening? Why are people fleeing the arts sector for greener pastures right now? What you're seeing across the art worlds, particularly in museums, is a lot of highly talented people with masters and PhDs being paid around $50,000 max for their work, sometimes for institutions that they've worked for for decades. The pandemic has caused a lot of layoffs and caused a lot of, you know, difficult conversations within staff about what's important to them. And, you know, museum workers and cultural workers see those layoffs as a representation of them not being important in the art world. So with all of the skills, with all the knowledge and intelligence that these people have, they say, hey, wait a minute, you know, I could work in the private sector for profit and make you know, twice or triple the income that I'm making here. You know, there have been a lot of allegations of misconduct and abuses of power in institutions in the art world lately. Mm -hmm. And they say, you know what, I I don't need that, right? I can go to a bigger corporation, which isn't exactly where artists probably want to end up, right? These are creative, free-spirited people. But at this point, I want 
mechanisms that will keep me protected. When you look at it like that, it really does present a pretty forbidding picture. I mean, you look around the art institutions in America and their trustees are coming under fire for all kinds of ethical problems and their staffs are unionizing in order to try to win some equitable employment terms. You see a lot of protests over representation. And it seems as if this art world that used to be seen as an embraceive place for you to go and find your home if you're a creative person is now maybe not so savory. And at the same time, as you say, wages are um, pretty low in the art world. Uh, you have to be in a city which has very high rents. And art school is just a, a ruinous debt. This sounds like a very broken system. What are the options for people who are trying to live a creative life, make a living through art in, in this kind of context? Well, I think your question gets to the point. You have to create a new system. So when you look at artists like Colette and Kelsey, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to make a system that's equitable, where they have control. What you're noticing in all of the controversies in the art world, it's not usually centered around the artists. Artists either don't have a voice or don't speak up in those contexts of, you know, museums unionizing or allegations of misconduct with museum officials, right? That's kind of in the bureaucracy. Artists, however, are still the ones that are facing the repercussions of those rules, right? Artists are rarely paid for exhibitions, for instance. Um, we know from studies that if you're born into a richer family, you're gonna be more successful as an artist. These things have been studied to death at this point, and there needs to be a new path forward. You know, that's what I hear from the professionals and from the artists. So it kind of remains to be seen. I think once we emerge from the pandemic, especially going through October, which is a month where a lot of the business incentives from the government end for companies, and, you know, we see more layoffs. I think that's going to be the conversation that needs to be had on sort of a global level. Hmm. I mean, when you talk about alternatives. TikTok seems to be showing some positive indications that it could be a useful tool. And, and one interesting thing that I found while kind of preparing for this podcast is that if a ban doesn't take place and TikTok is able to survive, art TikTok is pretty much wide open. I mean, the Metropolitan Museum of Art has a a page, but it doesn't have any videos posted. MoMA doesn't have one. The Whitney doesn't have one. It's like an unbuilt frontier. Mm -hmm. And that seems exciting. What do you think could happen if it doesn't get banned? If it doesn't get banned, it, it, I mean, it's really theirs for the taking. So you have the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, which is probably one of the only museums on TikTok right now, and certainly one of the only museums that's as popular as it is. It gets hundreds of thousands of views on videos from one of its curators telling snail jokes. So if you're looking at these big museums, it's a chance, I think, for them to cut through the chatter and also cut through a lot of the pain and hardship that these museums have faced in recent days to show a lighter side, which we haven't seen for a long time. Speaking of the lighter side, the Rijksmuseum is on TikTok. And as we all know, the Rijksmuseum is this incredible repository mm -hmm. of Dutch master art in Amsterdam, and they have a video of a Rembrandt portrait of this guy who apparently was the most um, eligible bachelor of his time before he got married. This young dude with close cropped hair does a, <laughs> a crazy dance move in homage to this Rembrandt portrait. That was not something I've seen before. Is that what we could expect <laughs> from museums? <laughs> I mean, expect the unexpected, right? I think with these museums, and that's a great example, you know, it, it's going to be really hard in the U.S. where museums have been hit the hardest because of the pandemic. But I wouldn't be surprised once we emerge from this, if TikTok is still around, that they'll be looking for that younger talent to help them. You know, if they have the funds and resources, why wouldn't you want that channel? Well, this has been fascinating. Thanks very much for coming on The Art Angle, Zachary. Yeah, thanks for having me. That's it for this week's episode of The Art Angle. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, take a moment to rate and review us. It will help other listeners discover what we're doing. 
The Art Angle is produced by Tim Schneider and Caroline Goldstein and edited by Nick Long. Thanks for listening and see you next week.